Muy buenas tardes a todos. Muchísimas gracias por conectarse hasta ahora con un webinar, parte de la estrategia de contacto maestro y del Programa Nacional de Bilingüismo. El día de hoy vamos a tener un, una conferencia que se va a realizar en inglés. Inicialmente lo vamos a hacer en español para presentar información importante acerca de las estrategias que los docentes de inglés pueden utilizar por parte del Ministerio de Educación Nacional. En este momento estamos conectados alrededor de 400 personas a través de nuestro Facebook Live y vamos a, estamos esperando que se conecten más docentes a nivel nacional, tanto de instituciones educativas oficiales como de colegios privados. Eh, el día de hoy tenemos a una experta de nuestro aliado Pearson, eh, Mónica Celes, quien es experta y nos va a estar compartiendo acerca de un tema que es muy importante en estos momentos y que está relacionado con el aprendizaje en casa y todo lo que tiene que ver con la evaluación eh, para el aprendizaje y cómo los docentes que están iniciando con estrategias de aprendizaje a distancia pueden incorporar ciertas prácticas y ciertas estrategias en la evaluación a nivel nacional. Eh, entonces, pues me presento, mi nombre es Carlos Amaya, eh, a la persona que está manejando la presentación, por favor, en la siguiente diapositiva. Mi nombre es Carlos Javier Amaya, yo soy el líder del Programa Nacional de Bilingüismo y como les mencioné, eh, pues el día de hoy nos está acompañando Mónica Celis, quien es experta y consultora académica de Pearson en Colombia, que está un aliado y quien nos está patrocinando y ayudando el día de hoy con este segundo webinar del Programa Nacional de Bilingüismo y que hace parte del ciclo de webinars y de conferencias que el Ministerio de Educación Nacional dispone. Siguiente diapositiva, por favor. Antes de comenzar la presentación, en español les voy a compartir pues cuatro cosas que son muy importantes que hacen parte de las estrategias del Programa Nacional de Bilingüismo. La primera ya tiene que ver con una serie de recursos que están disponibles en PDF y versiones digitales e interactivas que están disponibles en nuestra página de Aprender Digital a través de contenidos.colombiaprende.edu.co. Ahí hemos dispuesto la serie de textos de primaria y secundaria y media, Boni Bonita, English Please y Way to Go, que son libros que están disponibles con sus audios y sus versiones en PDF para que todos los docentes del país los puedan descargar, los puedan utilizar, eh, no hay problemas y restricciones de derechos de autor, eh, cualquier docente del país que quiera utilizarlo con sus estudiantes lo puede hacer y puede crear guías de aprendizaje a partir de estos libros. De igual forma, en una alianza con Pearson lanzamos una colección de libros de, de lectura y literatura eh, adaptada en inglés que puede ser utilizada por todos los docentes y estudiantes del país. Estos libros están adaptados en el nivel de lengua, son historias muy clásicas y muy divertidas que pueden apoyar en el aprendizaje de los niños en temas de vocabulario, en temas de comprensión de lectura y por supuesto, pues eh, ustedes a través de, de Aprender Digital se pueden registrar y pueden ingresar a estos contenidos que Pearson no se dio eh, durante este tema de aprendizaje en casa. La segunda tiene que ver con un lanzamiento que hicimos la semana pasada, que hizo el Plan Nacional de Lectura y Escritura, y es la Biblioteca Digital de Colombia Aprende, que está disponible para todos los colombianos, especialmente para las instituciones educativas oficiales. Ahí hay una colección de más de 3.000 recursos de lectura, y entre, dentro de esos 3.000 recursos de lectura incluimos una colección de 100 libros, más o menos, más de, un poquito más de 100 libros de, eh, que están en inglés, incluye libros de literatura, de literatura, de aprendizaje del inglés, y pues están accesibles accesibles a, a todas las instituciones educativas oficiales. La invitación es a que entren a la Biblioteca Digital de Colombia Aprende, se registren y empiecen a, a disfrutar no solamente de los contenidos de inglés, sino también de los contenidos que están disponibles en español. El tercer componente que queremos compartirles es que el día 6 de julio vamos a lanzar una convocatoria nacional para que todos los docentes de inglés del país puedan inscribirse a algo que hemos llamado Talkative, que son clubes de conversación que hacemos en alianza con la Embajada de Estados Unidos, los institutos colomboamericanos, la YMCA en Colombia y Peace Corps, que son organizaciones que nos están apoyando para conectar docentes internacionales y docentes colombianos expertos con nuestros docentes también de inglés en el sistema educativo y puedan compartir eh, a través de intercambio cultural y de intercambio lingüístico esa práctica del inglés que es tan importante. Eh, lo, el registro se lanzará el 6 de julio y pues les estaremos compartiendo más información al respecto pronto. El último punto antes de comenzar nuestro webinar que queríamos compartirles desde el Ministerio de Educación Nacional es el lanzamiento de nuestra aplicación Video One Challenge que ha sido muy importante para el sistema educativo, que si ustedes no la han descargado todavía la invitación es a que lo descarguen en sus dispositivos Apple y Android, ya se encuentra para las dos plataformas. 
eh, de manera tal que cualquier teléfono digital y cualquier tableta pueden ser utilizados para utilizar esta aplicación digital. El jueves pasado tuvimos un descargatón nacional que nos permitió que más de 42 mil estudiantes y docentes descargaran la aplicación y estuvieran ya empezando a utilizar para completar un número importante que tiene que ver con 147 mil usuarios activos que tenemos en este momento en la plataforma. Alrededor de la aplicación digital haremos otros webinars, haremos un descargatón adicional en el mes de agosto que estaremos anunciando para que pues, tanto docentes como estudiantes puedan aprovechar esta herramienta de grado sexto hasta grado 11 de manera continua y también pues, hemos estado trabajando de la mano de nuestro aliado del British Council en unos programas de formación para comprender muy bien cómo se puede utilizar esta herramienta en las estrategias de aprendizaje en casa. Eh, ahora voy a pasar a la parte en inglés, la conferencia se va a desarrollar en inglés entonces, uh, hello teachers, I would like to welcome you this time in English. Um, could you please, Monica, go to the next slide? I would like to introduce Monica Celis uh, in deep. Monica Celis is our presenter for today, and Monica Celis has expertise on postgraduate studies on neuropsychology and education. She holds a bachelor's degree on modern languages with emphasis on the methodology for English teaching. Monica is also a professional musician. This experience has impacted how they inter incorporate music in the teaching of English. She is from Pearson. And thank you very much for being with us and with all our teachers in, the, in Colombia. Good afternoon, Monica. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Carlos, for this nice, nice intervention and nice introduction. For, for me. Uh, so let's get started. Do you think we should get started or should we uh, wait for just some other teachers? Last, one last thing, uh, with my team, with the National Bilingualism Program, we're going to be checking on the comments. So if you have questions about the, this presentation, we are going to be checking on those comments and questions. And at the end, we are going to be sharing them with our presenter. So please be active and dynamic using the comment sections to ask the questions to the presenter. Thank you very much and have a nice presentation. Right off we go. Thank you, Carlos. And I will be asking some questions anyways. Um, let me make this smaller. And here we go. Well, today we're here to talk about some strategies and some activities and some pointers on how to apply effective assessment for learning. What is assessment for learning? Well, in, in short, it's what we call formative assessment, but with a practical application. So, um, without further ado, let's move on to this and see what the agenda is for today. Well, we're going to go over three points or three moments during our session today. The first one is going to be, we're going to talk about what assessment for learning is. If you've ever heard of it or not, we're going to take a look at basic concepts on assessment for learning. What is important about it? Why is it important, especially in the conditions that we are right now teaching, um, like in virtual, virtual environments, et cetera. Now, after that, we're gonna go into what student-centered learning environments are, why they are important, and how we can foster these learning environments. Uh, we talk about them in this particular presentation, because uh, there is no assessment for learning without student-centered environments. And after that, we're going to put the, the previous two points of assessment for learning and student-centered learning environments into, okay, how do I generate this interactivity in a synchronous learning environment? So in distance learning, how can I perform effective AFL and why is it important actually? And how can I foster student-centered learning environments? This with and without uh, information technology infrastructure. Actually, today we're gonna be talking about having little to none IT uh, infrastructure. So there's not going to be a problem if you feel like you only communicate with your students through WhatsApp, etc. We're going to be talking about that. Right? Let's go to our first point. What is assessment for learning? Feel free to go to the chat here on Facebook and write down whatever you know, whatever you think assessment for learning is. Have you ever heard about it? Do you know about it? Do you actually apply it? etc. Go ahead and write down your thoughts as I 
uh, move on to speaking. Well, whenever we hear the word assessment, we immediately associate it with testing. And really, assessment does not necessarily mean tests. There are many branches to assessment. One of them is what we call formative assessment. Now, when we talk about testing and about having a student take a test and us giving them a grade for it, 3.0, fail, pass, etc., all of that is what we call summative assessment, but that's not the topic for today. Today, we're going to be talking about assessment for learning. How do you uh, use your gauging, your observation as a teacher, your monitoring as a teacher, your gathering of evidence of the performance of students? How do you analyze it to actually help the student move forward uh, to whatever um, goals you're, you have actually traced and also help students in their process themselves? You can inform your teaching with it. So it's not about tests, actually. It's about all kinds of activities that you do inside and outside the classroom, virtually or not, that allow you to gather evidence to monitor and observe the performance of students uh, to help them in their process and to inform your teaching. So that's why uh, this is basically an ongoing process. This doesn't happen at uh, the end of a course or only at the beginning of a course. It happens all the time. At the beginning, during the course, at the end, all the time. It's an ongoing process. Uh, also, yeah, of course, as I said, it, it helps you inform your teaching. Sometimes uh, we tend to just stand there or, well, in the conditions as we're at right now, we tend to sit here in front of the computer and just wait for students to um, to, to, to listen to us and for us to say everything, etc. Well, um, that's not the best way for teaching yeah? because in that way we're doing all the talking, we're doing all the job, we're not listening to them. We are in many ways ignoring our students and their process. And when we ignore them, we don't have information as to how they are processing whatever uh, topics we're teaching, whatever things we're doing in class, then we cannot inform our own teaching. We don't know if students are understanding, if they are not understanding, if they're having problems or not, if they can do more or if they should do less. We don't know that. If we do, when we apply assessment for learning, it's possible, it's, it's easy to actually inform your teaching. So you inform your teaching and make decisions and redirect whatever you're trying to do in your teaching. Assessment for learning can also be done with many kinds of tasks. Virtually any task can be turned into an assessment for learning uh, task. Um, and I go again, to the top, to the, to the title of it. Why is it called assessment for learning? Because it's the observation and the monitoring we do that helps us inform the learning of our students and our teaching too. When we perform assessment for learning, when we apply this formative assessment in our classes, um, what do we do as teachers? We observe, we monitor, and we use resources to guide our students uh, to whatever next step or next, um, as Vygotsky called it, um, zone of proximal development they have. And not only this is not only for us, it's also for students. Without students' self-assessment, there is no assessment for learning. So you could be there trying to gather evidence of the performance of your students, but if you don't have students self-assess, assessment for learning is actually not going to be happening. Yeah? Um, so it's important because feedback has to be bilateral. We're going to be talking about that in a minute. Um, don't forget, please never forget that whatever kind of assessment we talk about, be it um, formative as this one, or be it summative as tests and all the other evaluations are, uh, never forget that all of this has to be revolving around a standard. 
when we don't have a standard and we just say whatever we believe students can do, that is not responsible assessment. That is um, what we'll call subjective assessment. That is not real assessment. There has to be a standard. There has to be a learning objective right there. Okay? All right. If you have any questions, once again, please use the chat and write them there. Okay. So to conclude, basically, assessment for learning is how do you gather evidence of the performance of students to you monitor, you observe, to gather these evidence, and you analyze it. For what purpose? To help your student move forward in their learning and to help yourself inform your teaching. Also, student self-assessment is of utmost importance, very, very important, crucial in assessment for them. And never forget the standards. Right? This is a nice um, definition of what assessment for learning is. And I have underlined the phrase inform their teaching or, of, or our teacher teaching because it's a basic thing for us when we apply uh, assessment for learning. It's basically using evidence about students' knowledge, understanding, skills, et cetera, to inform our teaching and then to help uh, clarify the learning process of our students. So this is important. Always inform your teaching, redirect whatever you need to redirect. It's like reflecting upon what you do. Yes, if you just continue going forward and never pay attention to, to what's going on in the actual class, uh, it's it's just you're missing out on a lot and your students are missing out on a lot. And the point there is that probably students are not going to get to the standards without your guidance. In assessment for learning, a teacher becomes a guide. It's not really a dictator that says everything. Which takes me to this next point. Student-centered learning environments. For assessment for learning to work, uh, we need to foster a learning environment, be it at school or virtually distance learning or not, it really doesn't matter. We need to foster an environment that is student-centered, in which the student is the main character of all this soap opera. Yeah? Uh, basically, um, there is actually uh, the opposite kind of environment, which is a teacher-centered environment. How is a teacher-centered environment, or what is it about? Well, a teacher-centered environment is basically when a teacher is the center of attention of everything that happens in the classroom, does most of the talking all the time in your, in your class or, or or events with your students, you do mostly everything. And then you tell your students to do par some particular exercises, but that's it. There's not a lot of participation. And then your student is a recipient, a passive recipient of all information. That really doesn't take us anywhere. Students don't have a chance to develop high order thinking skills in that kind of environment. And also, um, there is no assessment for learning without this kind of student-centered approach or learning environment. Why? Because assessment for learning needs you to have your students performing all the time, performing, doing, doing most of the time, so that you switch from being a dictator and the main character to being a facilitator or mostly a guide. Right. Let's see why then more more reasons why to 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 foster a student centered learning environment. And as I said, um, in this environment, the main character is not the teacher. It is the student. And yeah, that's important when the student is the main character. The student is asking questions. The student is performing. The student is creating rich products. The student is doing what we expect them to do, actually. Right? Um, students perform most of the time. Um, personally, personally, I like to recommend that
that uh, if you're a teacher and you're applying uh, this kind of, of student centered learning environment, you have your student perform at least 80% of the time. And then you allow at least a 20% or even less if you can for direct instruction, for you to be the main character giving instructions, talking about theory or whatnot. But that's, you know, just make it. 20% of the class time, 80% of the class time, have students perform, have them make mistakes, have them um, um, find themselves in what they're doing, and you be there and you be a guide. And of course, perform assessment for learning. When this happens, well, it's no easy pie. Sometimes because students are used to teacher centered environment, so they are used to listening to us to being there uh, passive uh, waiting for whatever we're going to give them. Yeah, so they're used to that. So. Taking them to this new order of how things are done. Sometimes it's challenging, but it pays off. Believe me that it pays off. Uh, one of the things you have to do to be able to foster these environments is that you have to develop agency and autonomous learning in your students. And this is basically metacognition. The students are able to know um, and uh, think about how they learn and have strategies to do things on their own so that you can be a guide rather than the person who is telling them what is step one, step two, how to do everything, et cetera. Right? And you know what is amazing uh, right now, and I'm happy about it. I think this pandemics, this COVID-19 has taken us to a place I thought we were going to be achieving in many years, at least in 20 years, which is this student-centered environment. Um, I think, um, it's, it's wonderful that we have now the opportunity to do it because this contingency is actually forcing us to create this particular environment. And, and well, as I told you uh, before, this allows us to do what we must do, which is assessment for learning. How do we foster um, student-centered learning environments? Well, besides things I've already said, um, this is an environment in which students create rich products. So here you have to be very creative in the sense of, okay, create the design, give students activities that are not just going to be tasks. There are going to be a whole experience for students for them to create rich products. So it's not just uh, do this activity, match the options, um, tell me whether the the answer is A, B, or C, that's not really it. It's uh, maybe part of it, but not really it. Um, give students activities, uh, ideas, maybe projects, maybe tasks that they feel like they have to create. And they have to use critical thinking, creativity, and all those 21st century learning um, skills. Yeah? Also, Foster self-assessment. Students, uh, student-centered learning environments have students self-assessing all the time because they have to be gauging or measuring how well they're doing and how to recalculate where to go and how to come up with this rich product and how to perform. Yeah? In this particular environment, students should be clear on three particular things, mainly. Uh, not that these are the only ones, um, learning objectives. They need to know what the learning objective or whatever project or task you are working on. So the learning objectives are these, and they need to know and be very clear about what these particular aims are. Um, not only that, but the purposes. Why am I doing this task? Why am I working this way? What am I going to achieve? And also, how do I make progress? And how do I measure my own progress as a student? This is important. You as a teacher, be creative in which ways you're going to foster this. Uh, maybe you can fragment your tasks or your student-centered environment activities into chunks and mini, um, mini objectives. You can do that so that students feel accomplished and they can measure their progress, for example. Also, when we're talking about 
asynchronous uh, learning environments, uh, we have, of course, to talk about pre-assigned work. We're going to be talking about that in a minute. Make sure also that uh, the activities that you give your students here are engaging. So don't do this. Uh, we have already done it, and I think it's played out, as we say. Don't go about, okay, write a paragraph about your room. Or, okay, solve this exercise and tell me whether the answer is A, B, or C and match the options. Well, this is nice, but maybe it was, you know, one minute activity or a two minutes activity for fostering the rest of activities, but this is an energy engaging activity. Have your student, I don't know, create a poll, uh, um a podcast for example or a comic in a paper or something in which they have to actually get information from many places and use critical thinking and creativity to put it there those are the activities that are engaging for students simple as that engaging activities are the activities that help us or that make our students use creativity and critical thinking when you give students uh, very easy activities. Well, that's not engaging. That's very demotivating sometimes. Eh? Also, these activities could include inquiry, like how to investigate research on things, for example, and active learning strategies and activities. Um, how do you keep your students active? Active learning is one very amazing topic. Uh, maybe in the future we can talk about it, but it's essentially how do you make your students be active within their learning, not just passive about listening, but activities that make them move or, or, or be in action. Yeah? And of course, fill yourself with resources. Resources are important in what sense? Um, Scott Thornbury, I don't know, I don't know if, you, if you know him, but he's one of the most important exponents on uh, English language teaching at the moment. He says that the best resource that you can have as a teacher, is yourself. Books are amazing, platforms are amazing, photocopies are amazing, but the most amazing resource is you. If you have studied ways to do things, if you are creative, if you have studied all of those resources I just cited, you are your best resource, regardless of the infrastructure that you have regardless of the internet, regardless of what you have, if you have electricity or not, regardless of it, it's you. It's always you. Um, please make sure or be free to go to the chat and write down whether you think or not that you foster a student learning environment. Do you foster these environments or not? And how do you do it? Write it down. We would love to hear from it. Okay. Uh, one more thing about student-centered environments. If you feel your students are too quiet on the other end of the screen uh, of the WhatsApp or the video conference or even in your classroom, this is your cue to stop. Stop, turn it around. This is because you are doing most of the work. Turn it around and make it student-centered. Give them something to do. Give them activities to keep them busy, performing with creativity and critical thinking. And then when your students are performing, this is the best moment in which you can perform assessment for learning. Right? Perfect. I'm going to move to the next slide. Okay, what are we going to be talking about now in asynchronous activity? Um, we're going to put together what, um, yeah, what the things we have talked about today. Assessment for learning and student-centered environments together to generate asynchronous interactivity. Let's talk about asynchronous uh, work. Yeah? Um, it's what we are going, we're having to do now. Um, students are away from us. Uh, they are not in the same classroom anymore and for some time, um, depending on what happens with the pandemics. Um, so we have to create ways in which they are, they're still working, regardless of how we are apart in time and in place. Yeah. 
So that's the, the concept of asynchronous learning, that you learn in different times or in different places. Now, um, to be able to foster this kind of, of, of learning environment uh, or teaching environment too, um, it is important to generate interactivity. Because what's the first fear that we have when we have to teach this way? Wow, my students are not there. How am I going to communicate? Same happens with assessment for learning. Assessment for learning when you are there with your students in your classroom is easy because you have students do the activity and then you walk around, you take notes, you listen, you monitor, you observe and see what students are doing. It's easy to do. And then you analyze the evidence and then you move forward. Now, uh, how am I going to do it? How am I going to do it if students are not there? I'm not seeing my students. Well, the fear that we get, it's because we feel that we have been robbed from what we have naturally in a classroom, which is communication channels or interactivity channels. In a classroom, um, when you're there with your students, they can just raise their hand or go to you or just say something that they want to say. And uh, same goes for you. Yeah? Um, that's the difference in asynchronous learning or distance learning. Probably that is not very natural, but it doesn't matter because it's not that we cannot generate it. We can, of course, generate it. Uh, so what we have to do when we think about asynchronous distance learning is how do I generate channels of interactivity with or to my students? Let's let's move forward and see about it. We're going to be talking about what this interactivity is about, um, how we can generate it and use activities and strategies for assessment for learning when we have no uh, inf information technology infrastructure and when we have some information or little to none information technology infrastructure. Right? So asynchronous, asynchronous interactivity, if you want to read further on what this is, you can read Mayadas. Um, his work from 1997 is very explanatory on what this is. And it's basically how do you interact asynchronously, yes, in different times or places with your students. Actually, asynchronous interactivity in what we're doing can be very easily accurate or, or be the same as assessment for learning. So we should take advantage of assessment for learning for generating asynchronous interactivity and then have a successful process of asynchronous learning or distance learning with our students. Yeah? Now think about which resources and tools are you using to create this environment? Yes, Are you actually creating interactivity asynchronically? Yes, are your students over there at home uh, feeling free to talk to you or to send you a message, uh, not necessarily through email, not necessarily through WhatsApp, through their learning guides, the guides or the papers that you send them? Do you feel they are free to communicate with you in whatever way possible? Think about that because we need to generate or create those channels of interactivity with our students. Yeah? So, it doesn't matter if we have technology or no. We have to find a way to listen to our students. How do we listen to our students? Well, using those channels of interactivity. If they can use them to give us information and we can use them to send them information, there is communication regardless of being uh, asynchronically. Yeah? Now, uh, the best recipe for this is clear instructions, using models. Well, if you are going to ask your students to um, do a project or to, I don't know, create a podcast, for example, don't just tell them, show them how to do it. Give them models, right? Uh, also resources, fill yourself with resources. Resources are also ways to do things yeah? and good tasks. And I should have written there creativity. Yeah? All right, so let's see what kinds of, of, of interactivity channels we can create to foster assessment for learning. Okay, 
So remember that we're putting everything together here. We're putting assessment for learning, we're putting uh, asynchronous learning or distance learning together so that you feel more accomplished and more successful teaching your students in the way that we're teaching right now. So the general idea is in your distance learning, how do I open these channels of interactivity so that I can communicate with my students at a distance uh, in an asynchronous way and that I can perform assessment for learning in this way? Because the risk of having students away from us is that we don't do formative assessment. Therefore, we can never check whether they are getting to the uh, learning, uh, learning objectives, sorry, or not. Yeah. So, what is an interactivity channel? Yes, you have to make sure that there is a channel of communication that you use with your student to communicate information with them. So there is a channel that they use to send you information and there is a channel that you use to send them information, regardless of technology. Don't worry, you can do this with zero to none technology. Yeah? And make sure to always, always keep these channels of interactivity open okay make sure so there are two two channels or there's actually one channel if you want to create it that goes both ways two channels or one channel both ways one of them is teacher to student so these are the ways or the channels that you use to communicate information to your student this can be classwork this can be your instructions to do something this can be the models so that they can see oh this is how this is done etc cetera, etc cetera. many things that you can communicate or even your assessment too yeah your formative assessment too now from student to teacher your student over there at home and to you these are the ways or the channels or the forms they use or you establish as a teacher and leave open for students to communicate information to you. So this information can be their self-assessment, it can be uh, their difficulties, it can be their obstacles in the classwork that you assigned, it can be their own performance. So there are many things that students need to communicate to us. When you have these two channels working, there is something beautiful that happens, and it's that the feedback becomes bilateral as it should be many times we do one-sided feedback so you student you're doing things like this you get a 2.0 we rarely listen to our students feedback has to be has to go both ways or it should go both ways because it's the best kind of, fee of feedback session okay? right let's do this with no technology if you are a teacher there looking at me right now and you say well i have some technology but my students have no technology they're at home their parents can't read their parents have no internet no computer um they have no phone uh no smartphone all we can do is send them learning guides well let's create some uh interactivity channels using the learning guides Right? And worry not, no internet needed. Yeah? So some pointers for the learning guides. When you create them, remember to be explicit. Yes, you need to be with instructions, you need to be explicit, you need to be clear, and you need to be concise. Why? Because your little student over there is going to be on his own or on her own doing this. So you have to make that paper resemble you the most so it's like a part of you is as if you sent one of your hands to your student yeah that sounds terrible but it's something like that a little bit of you has to go in that paper to that student yeah so for clear explicit and concise instructions my recommendation is don't just write down please do exercise b no Use graphic organizers to show how things go. Use pictures, use keywords. These are very helpful for students to understand what is expected of them. And not only this, but modeling. So my recommendation is that you leave one page that is concerning 
instructions and all of the things that I'm going to talk about today. Like this one page that students can look at, locate themselves in and be like, okay, now I know what to do. And now I know where to write down whatever I don't understand, etc. Something else, remember to open an interactivity channel. What door am I going to open for my student to communicate to me whatever happened to him when he was doing the activities? Well, you should leave a space open in your learning guide, maybe in that first page, as I'm saying. And for example, we have an example here in the images that you're looking at. So this is, for example, a guide. This is a writing exercise. And then next to it, I have something like this. I write down some questions. If you want to, you can write down questions or you can just leave it blank and tell your student, this is the blank space you can use to write anything to me, to tell me that you miss me or to tell me that uh, uh, you had problems with something, which kinds of problems you had with doing what kind of activity, what was easy, what was difficult, what you didn't understand, what obstacles did you have? Do you have any questions, your doubts, etc.? Just leave a blank space that they feel like, okay, this is like my telegram to my teacher. And it's not going to be right now that he's going to see it, but when he gets my learning guide with my answers and, and my issuing, he is going to see what I need. Yeah? And do not tell me that it's better, that it's not better to receive back your learning guides with all this information. Isn't it better than just having a learning guide with, re with answers that you have to grade? Of course, it's better to have like your students' peace of mind. So you see, you can open an interactivity channel with your students at a distance with no internet. Also, this is the information that you use to perform assessment for learning because you read that and you go, ah, oh, this is what we need to do. You redirect your teaching, you inform your teaching, and you can guide your students. So can you do assessment for learning with no internet? Of course you can. Can you generate student-centered environments with no internet? Of course you can. Can you um, establish an interactivity channel of communication with your students with no internet? Of course you can. If these are the resources you have, that's the way to do it. Right? Remember, remember always learning objectives. All the items in your learning guide have to be linked to a learning objective. Otherwise, your assessment for learning is not going to be as good. Right? And well, design activities that keep your student busy. Remember, not just A, B, or C, match, etc., but things that will keep them busy. Right? If you have any questions or doubts about how to do this with no internet, no technology, no IT infrastructure, please write them down in the chat, can you? Uh, also, if you have a nice anecdote to tell us of how you do this without internet, please write it down. We'll be happy to, to read. All right, uh, just taking a few minutes to go over this point, which is the magic of clear instructions. Um, listen, instructions are so important. And when whether you're doing a learning guide like this, like these ones that we have to do, or um, whether you are in class with your students in front of you or in a video conference, etc. Well, um, it's very important to give your students clear instructions. One of the ways to do that is to model yourself or with pictures, whatever you are expecting of your student, whatever they have to do, because they go back. They're very visual. Many students are very visual. They go back and see what is the example they have to do, and they try to resemble with their own resources. So modeling is very important. So in your instructions, model. Yeah? Also, remember what I said before. Think that your student is going to be doing this activity on his or her own. So there you go. And try to work some metacognition activities. Yes. Um, you know, us teachers are very, our teachers actually, and very good teachers, because we have very nice 
or very good metacognition. Metacognition happens in the prefrontal cortex of the brain. Um, it's part of what we call executive functions. In many ways, we can say that. And um, what happens there is, is it's this little voice that you have in your head that asks you the questions and those particular questions that guide your learning. Yes. So when we are teachers, we have this, or when we are people who are self-taught, uh, for example, you learn to play the guitar on your own. If you manage to achieve that, it's because you have good metacognition. Yeah? So we have to foster these in students right now because they are there on their own and they need that little voice. And sometimes that little voice is the teacher's voice. You'd be amazed at how many people don't have metacognition actually developed or, or, or not very well developed. And they don't have that little voice in there sometimes. So our voice is their little voice in there. So train your students and include something in your in your learning guides about metacognition. Yeah? Well, write your inst instructions down, continuing. Uh, keywords, images, all the things that I mentioned before. Yeah? Right. Good, so now we're going to change into, okay, now let's say that you have the luxury of having a little information technology infrastructure. And I am talking about a little, a smartphone and uh, WhatsApp or Telegram, okay? Only that. Can you generate student-centered environments this way? Yes, you can. Can you um, do or perform assessment for learning this way? Yes, you can. Can you open channels of interactivity using only WhatsApp? Of course you can. It's actually easier, right? So let's see what you can do. Please don't be scared at looking at this like, okay, this is my tool for teaching. Wow, WhatsApp is my tool for teaching. No, that's not your thinking. Your thinking should be, how do I use WhatsApp or Telegram that I'm going to talk about, how can I use WhatsApp or Telegram or how can I use messaging apps to generate and create interactivity channels with my students? That is the question that you should have in your brain. That should be your metacognition for all of this. Okay, so let's go. How can you do this? Well, there are many things you can do with, with this messaging apps. They're wonderful, yeah? I don't know if you know um, broadcast lists or messaging lists. In Spanish, we call them lista de difusión. Um, in Telegram, we call them channels. Yeah? So it's just a chat that you create. Um, you include many people in there. And the only person that can write information is the creator of that group because you can also create groups in which everyone can speak, right? Or, or actually type, yeah? Um, but this one, this broadcast list is actually not for that. It's, it's just for you, just for you um, as a teacher to send information. So you can use the broadcast lists to send um, the learning guides or send, send uh, activities or Word documents, PDFs, et cetera, that you want your students to, to, to work on, right? Also, I recommend sometimes we have very heavy um, resources. So maybe we have um, a PD, uh, PDF or we have a PowerPoint that is very, very heavy and it's difficult to send it to my students because there's not enough data in their phones to get them. Well, you teacher, you that have a little more IT infrastructure, go online and there are some websites that you can go and upload your document, be it a PDF, a PowerPoint, whatever, and compress it. There are also softwares such as uh, Zip or anything that can help you compress your, um, your files. This is very good because when you're going to send them, it's easily sent because they're not heavy. So make sure to use this, these tools, yeah, these softwares or the online pages that help you compress your information. That helps you with the sending of information in an easier way. In this broadcast list, you can write your prompts, you can write your homeworks, you can write your instructions in there. So students only have to go to that broadcast list and look at the instructions. The instructions are there. Go back to it. 
easily done. Yeah? So this is a, your channel of interactivity from teacher to student. Use broadcast lists. Yeah? And also be creative on how you're going to send those instructions. Send pictures, send videos, send voice notes of models. Like, okay, you guys, what you're going to do is you are going to create, um, um, what is it? A podcast, for example. And the, the podcasts are done this way. I'm going to show you an example. So this is an example of my podcasts. So hello, people. La, la, la. So that's one way to do it, not just write it, but also be creative. Yeah, you know that WhatsApp and Telegram allow you to record your voice, send videos, send pictures, etc. Actually, uh, for this particular uh, activities that we're doing, I recommend Telegram a little more because uh, it consumes less data. It's easier to use and also um, it allows you to do a little more than WhatsApp because you can create folders in which you, you can contain uh, activities, files, etc., and share with your students. And in those channels, those broadcast lists or lists as they soon, you can also create another chat, uh, like a chat for that channel. So people can write things regarding that broadcast list in a different um, chat. Yeah, so people can write down. In this chat, you can actually pull your students you can actually ask them okay as you see here in a very small picture um you can ask your students okay uh do you agree with this yes or no and then you'll have the votes of your students yes uh 20 percent said no 20 percent uh, or 20 70 80 percent said yes etc so you can poll your students polling and asking questions through these broadcast lists in whatsapp or in telegram can help you create what we call, I guess you get it now, it's the interactivity channel of the student to the teacher, right? So it's how you get the information from your student to you. If you poll your students, you're going to get information. If you uh, ask a question or pin a comment, yes, because you can pin a comment up there and then ask a question and talk about that topic and generate like a mini forum, yeah? you get information from your students. So it's very easily to done. You can really generate those uh, channels of interactivity. Yeah? So make sure to, to sum up, make sure to compress the files you're going to use using a software or a website to help you. Uh, I recommend Telegram because it really consumes less data. So if you have a problem with the data plan of your phone, use Telegram. Um, also for your students, sometimes they don't have a lot of data or they don't have a Wi-Fi or maybe they do, but it's low or they're using someone else's. So make it easy. Compress the, the files. Also be creative, send pictures, videos, voice notes of your models and the instructions also. And do this by the creation of broadcast lists or listas de difusión that allow you to only send the information yourself and maybe in Telegram, you can generate another chat that is linked to that list of diffusion or to that uh, channel or broad broadcast list in which people can talk and you can ask questions. You can poll your students, create a folder and share it with these people in this channel and uh, pin a comment. So a comment will be there in the, on the top of the uh, of the file, sorry, or, or of the conversation for a while etc etc so you can of course do it whether you get when you get this information analyze it and then you'll be performing assessment for learning so again can you perform assessment for learning this way yes of course you can can you perform uh stu generate student-centered environments this way yes of course you can you just have to be creative and resourceful okay? please write down in the chat here in fa on facebook Please write down what activities do you do using WhatsApp or Telegram? What have you done? What has been difficult? Write it down. Okay, and we're getting to the end, sadly, because I have had so much fun, for sure. Um, what to take home with you? Like, what is the conclusion or some of the conclusions uh, for us of this particular um, webinar? Yeah. Well, 
you guys, without assessment for learning, there are no standards. And I call you you guys because I am one of you. I am also a teacher. I am not just one person here holding the absolute truth, telling you everything you, you have to do or know. It's just, I am a teacher. I am one of you. And I feel your difficulties right now. Uh, we have to reinvent ourselves and teach in this crazy way. Um, but anyways, regardless of how we teach, regardless of the setting in which we are, be it in the classroom or away from our students, without internet or with internet, regardless of this, the same standards of teaching and learning apply. So without learning objectives, you can never perform assessment for learning. And without assessment for learning, you can never guarantee that your students get to the standards. And then when they go and take the Saber Pro or Saber tests or standardized tests to graduate, then we will see that they don't get to the standards that we need to. Yeah. Why? Because we never performed assessment for learning. Yeah. Let's recapitulate. Assessment for learning is how you manage to gather evidence of the performance of your students. How do you manage that? How do you monitor or observe? How do you get that evidence? You analyze the evidence and you can tell your students, ha, huh, you're having difficulties here, you're having problems there, et cetera, et cetera, right? And you can guide your teaching and the learning of your students, yeah? So remember to do this. It's very important, it's essential to have a learning objective. Without a learning objective, all of the things we talked about don't apply because we have to achieve objectives and help our students achieve the objectives. That's our job. Yeah? You always should assess around a standard. Again, I'm not talking about tests. I'm not talking about exams. Well, you do that also in exams, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about formative assessment. I'm talking about assessment for learning. I'm talking about the tasks you use to do AFL. Okay, so this isn't done without a standard. Also, it's a good idea to break a standard into its components. Okay, okay, so this learning objective will have vocabulary, will have functional language, sub skills, etc., and work to assess sequentially. Yeah? Um, use the standards, and for that, uh, if you want to, you can check our Global Scale of English. This is a website that is open for anyone anywhere in the world. Uh, just type in Global Scale of English Pearson, and there you can get nice standards that, of course, are aligned to what you already do at school and the curriculum that the government has for us. They're definitely aligned. They're very actually more fragmented in the sense that they're more granular. So they are going to help you a lot. Other than that, my conclusions are basically make sure to always ask this question. How do I generate interactivity channels for me to do assessment for learning? Am I generating it or not? Is my student feeling free to communicate to me or not in an asynchronous way? But anyways, is he or not? So always ask yourself that and generate this channels of interactivity. When you do, your student will be there on the other side of your screen or at home in a very student-centered environment, and he will send you the information through that interactivity channel that you can use to assess their learning and then redirect what you do and help them still guide them. If we don't guide them, they won't get to the standards. Right? right? This is the recipe. Yeah. Uh, my instructions make them clear that they get it or not. Have students BC. Keep them busy doing something creative, remember, and that allows them to use critical thinking. Yeah? Create mechanisms to listen to your student. Foster those interactivity channels. Yeah? Make sure to always listen to them. Inform your teaching. Use metacognition. Whatever you do, keep the standards in mind and aim at the realistic. Maybe in the situation we have to be uh, we have to distill a little content 
uh, because of the, uh, the amazing or the many things that we have to do and because we are now in this situation. So aim at the realistic and keep the essential. That's probably what we have to do. Maybe not wanting to achieve all the learning objectives of the year. Probably there's something to be uh, possible to do. Keep the essentials in mind. Right. Do you guys have any questions? Thank you very much, Monica. I'm sure this uh, presentation has been really enriching for our teachers. They have been really active on comments. We have hundreds of questions for you that we would like to have all the time to share. We have picked up some of the questions, the more recurring questions that teachers have made. Uh, and I'm going to start with the first one. Yes? Okay, go okay. ahead. So one of the teachers asked us, how can we work formative assessment when the schools require grades in order to obtain a score? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the answer is simple, rubrics. Um, formative assessment is the best way for you to make sure that students get to the standards. Summative assessment, so the grades, yes, which is the end of the process, is when you tell a student, yes, you got a five because you achieved the learning objective. Now, um, my recommendation is the following. Without assessment for learning, it's the chances of students to get to the, to the standard are not many. Yeah? So if you perform assessment for learning, you're actually helping your students to get a better grade. Without assessment for learning, it's like, it's um, unfair a little because we teach them something and then we give them a test or an exam and then we expect them to do you know, to do well. And then because we never did assessment for learning, um, students are actually going to be there uh, with still their mistakes, their problems, the difficulties, etc., the obstacles that you never help them actually surpass. They're going to show them there in the exam. And in there, their mistakes have a price, which is the grade. So assessment for learning is not something different from the test. It takes you to be better at that test. And also, um, you use the rubrics to help you guide that process. And so as you are, and let's see, checking that your student is achieving the learning objective bit by bit, yes, you can at the end, uh, when you test them, and using the rubrics, of course, in the process, and at the end, you can check whether they have achieved it or not with a grade. Yeah? So grades could be a tool for improving the learning of, the, of students as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank, you very much. Thank you very much to the teacher that made the question. question. And I'm going to go to the second question. Uh, how can we foster a student-centered environment when giving our sessions through WhatsApp? Always think. Student-centered environment is, where, is, a, is an environment in which students are the center of attention, the main character. The best way to do this is to give them activities that keep them busy doing, yes, um, that keep them busy creating, yes. So if you assign activities that will keep them busy, that is a student-centered environment. The only thing is that you're not going to see it because your student is at home, but he is in a student-centered environment. And then the rest of the learning experience is still learning, is still, sorry, student-centered um and put because you're going to be there guiding them yeah so the, the first thing you need to do is create a task that will keep them busy creating and using critical thinking thank you very much and activities also that look for the well-being of students are also important to take into account um, Absolutely. the third question is where can i find example of those engaging activities to use in an asynchronous way? Um, in many ways, I think um, the resources that Carlos mentioned before at the beginning of this session are very useful for you. So go ahead and, and use them. Uh, other than that, um, I know that sometimes us as teachers, we want to, we, we want to get like predetermined or, or resources that are already done. Yeah, there have been done already by someone else. Um, I think to foster a student-centered learning environment, 
uh, the resources, many of them can, should be created by you. Not that you have to do all the job. Please don't get me wrong. It's not that you have to do everything. It's that um, it's your creativity and your, your knowledge of your students what really make it come alive and be, uh, let's see, to make it click with your student. So I think there are many places in which you can look for ideas for projects, for example, or ideas for uh, technology-based tasks, et cetera. But what maybe what you'd be looking for is task-based learning. Yeah, so read a little about task-based learning, and then you can adapt many of the things that you already have, like the ones that Carlos mentioned at the beginning, uh, or the ones that Pearson has, et cetera. You can adapt them to the student-centered learning environment. So my first recommendation, read about task-based learning. Great, thank you very much for that answer. Uh, I'm gonna follow to the next question. We have a couple of more. Um, can you please give us examples of some activities to develop metacognition in English language teaching? Yes, that's a, that's a, a wonderful topic that not many people are talking about, and I think we all need it, and we need it now. Um, Let's let's start by rephrasing again what uh, metacognition is. Metacognition is how you think about thinking, how you uh, understand about how you learn, yes, to learn about how you learn. Um, one way to, to tackle this at the beginning is strategic questioning. So maybe what you need to train your students on is, okay, while doing a task, what, a, what questions should you ask yourself? Maybe you should write the actual question in there in a different font, for example, or in a different color. Like, okay, whenever you see the question that is in blue, it's a question that you need to think about. Okay, this question is going to guide the process. Yes, this, this is one example of an activity for working on metacognition because it's what we ultimately want our students to have in, our, in their minds, like there, installed. The, those questions should appear there without us saying anything. But anyways, as I say, this is a long topic that we could discuss if it's possible later on. Thank you very much, Monica. Um, the fifth question is about how, uh, could you please give us examples of how to give bilateral feedback in asynchronous situations? Like if you could give us a specific example of, of an activity that teachers would be able to use or adapt. Okay, well, you need to send that information in terms of self assessment to your students. You give them a tool to self assess. Maybe if you, you're working with no internet, nothing, no technology, and you have to generate learning guides, maybe in, in the learning guide you should include a little uh, part for self assessment. So write it down, write the learning objectives there, and maybe uh, your student can. Um, paint uh, or maybe draw a happy face or a sad face or a neutral face according to how they feel or maybe that you can use also the traffic lights for that maybe red maybe yellow maybe green in terms of how uh, they feel that they have achieved or not this particular objective yeah so that's the first step uh, you can also do that with other tools with whatsapp etc uh, students can actually send you a voice note uh, telling you, okay, uh, in the first learning, uh, in the first learning objective, I don't feel so good because I have problems with this, or I feel very good. I think I know everything, etc. So you can do this in written in the learning guides or through WhatsApp. It's easy. It's simple. First thing down, the self-assessment has to happen. Second thing, you should have an analysis and the of the evidence of the performance of the student so that you can send them your own information too. Yes, so bilateral means that your student sent you their self-assessment information and you sent them your self-assessment, your assessment information of his performance or her performance. Now, try to do this um, after you get the self-assessment, okay? Let them do the talking first so that you can see where they are and this informs your assessment. So it is asynchronous, but you're still having this both um, channels. 
Great, Monica. Thank you very much for that. that that's very useful for our teachers. And the last question, because I'm aware of time, and I'm really sorry that we couldn't be able to pick up all the questions, but I'm sure that all the teachers have been very active on comments, and all your answers have been really helpful. So I'm going to read the last question, and then we're going to stop this uh, second webinar of the National Bilingualism Program. How to motivate the students to read large text? Most of them dislike to read, and they feel frustrated because almost all the time they use a dictionary to look for every meaning of the world, of the words, and how to how to use assessment as a way to solve this. Hmm. That's wonderful. We could write a book, you and I, about that, <laughs> because it's an interesting topic. Um, simple. Chunk it down. Chunk it down fragmented many times students feel demotivated because the reading is so long and on top of that what you say the vocabulary is there all over and it's like an impossible task to achieve so chunk it down uh dyslexic students also have some difficulties because they're dyslexic but also some of the strategies that we use for dyslexic students can help for neurotypical students uh for example take a paper Let's see if I have a paper over here. Uh, I don't. Take a paper like this, a blank paper, and then cut out a square in the paper. Yeah. So when you cut it out, you'll have uh, a hole in your paper. What are students going to do with that hole? They're going to place the paper on the reading and then because there is only a hole this will uh, only show one paragraph or one part of the reading so in this way we work with dyslexic students so that they only uh they don't get this visual pollution they just look at um this particular part of the page and they can perform better so this is one way you can chunk down all the process also um tell them that it's not about understanding every single word like reading comprehension is not necessarily about understanding every single word of the text it's about um it's about understanding the context it's about achieving learning objectives for reading and in maybe applying also learning strategies for for pre-reading and, and et cetera. So it's, it's about many other things. So be clear with your students about what you're doing. Are you deciphering every single word of the text or are you just looking for the main idea? Or are you just applying uh, prediction or any other pre-reading activity? Or uh, you are looking for the meaning of specific words, yes? Um, whatever. And to finish, because as I tell you, this can be a book. Um, whatever you can enhance or help with images, the better. Because images, like music, as I am a professional singer, images and music are the universal language. So whatever you translate into an image, your student is going to get easily. Yes. And it helps them in their mind translate uh, the concept from the picture to what it's it's happening there. So make sure to use lots of images. Chunk it down. So again, chunk it down. Uh, use strategies like this one. Um, tell them that they're achieving a learning objective, not just reading a text. Uh, make them sure that they know what they're going to do and use images. It helps a lot. Thank you. Wonderful answer. And I would like to invite the teacher also to use our app called Be The One Challenge. The seventh mission is about reading comprehension and it has great text and great activities to improve uh, this kind of activities with students. And we are also going to propose a webinar in which we are going to use the readers of Pearson and some of the readers that are available on or in the Biblioteca Digital of Colombia Print. So just be attentive to our um, a schedule of activities and we are going to invite you to participate on that. Monica, thank you very much. This has been really great. Uh, I think uh, teachers have been listening and being connecting uh, actively. We invite all the teachers to be attentive to contactomaestro.colombiaprende.edu.co. Uh, we are posting all our webinars, not only for English language teachers, but also for all kinds of teachers uh, in Colombia. 
and you're well, more than welcome to come and join us in these discussions that we have with different kinds of experts like today, Monica Sales, for, Monica Sales from Pearson. Thank you very much for this, uh, for this presentation, for answering the questions of our teachers. I hope we have the opportunity to have you back in one of our webinars. And I don't know if you wanna say hey, goodbye to our teachers. Absolutely, Carlos, if you'll have me, I'll be here. I love doing this, as you say. It's, it's, it's my favorite thing to do after sleeping and pizza and music. <laughs> And so have me anytime, I'll be here. Thank you so much for everyone who's over there uh, watching this. I hope this was useful at least a little bit. And I hope you at least took a little thing that can help your teaching be better. I know how it is to be a teacher and sometimes feel like you don't have lots of resources. So I hope this was useful in any, in any level. Thank you so much for your time. And well, Pearson, always learning. Thank you very much, Pearson. And thank you very much, Monica. Thank you very much, teachers and see you next time. Bye-bye. Have a nice day. Listo, Moni, ya dejamos de transmitir, no te preocupes. Okay. Listo, bien todo.